Bak. Okay. Merhaba arkadaşlar. Hepiniz IFT Talks webinarlarına hoş geldiniz. Bugün University of British Columbia'da eğitim ve mezuniyet sonrası kariyer olanaklarını sondan dinliyor olacağız. Lütfen sorularınızı questions kısmından sormayı unutmayınız. Yes, Tom. The stage is yours now. Thank you everybody to uh, learning all about you know, British Columbia. Uh, very, very pleased to be with you today. So I think the, the best way for the format for the next 45 minutes will be for me to share with you a presentation about UBC. And within that presentation, of course, I'll talk a lot about my university, uh, the admissions requirements, what it takes to apply, but also we'll look at our two campuses and we'll look a little bit more about what it means to be studying in Canada and maybe compare and contrast that with other countries like the US, uh, maybe like the UK or, or elsewhere in Europe, which are always popular destinations with international students. Now, as you may know, uh, on the right hand side of the screen is a question box. So what I'll encourage you to do is type any questions that you have into that question section. And at the end of the, the presentation, I'll have time to make sure that I'm answering all those questions as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so if you just give me, here we go. 10 seconds or so, I'll make sure we pull this up. So you should all now be able to see the University of British Columbia logo and my name underneath there. So I'll quickly introduce myself again. My name is Tom and I work with UBC as their European representative. So I am actually based in the UK as opposed to being over on the west coast of Canada. So I do look after a large number of countries within Europe uh, and Turkey is one of the countries I'm taking on board this year. And I'm really looking forward to working with Turkish students and Turkish schools moving forward. I've got a long history in international education. Uh, in case you're wondering why someone from the UK is working for Canadian University, I was actually an international student myself. So even though I'm from a small village just outside of Manchester in the UK, I actually went to the US and studied my undergraduate and also my postgraduate qualifications over there. And ever since uh, graduating from university, I've been working in international education. So it's taken me all around the world uh, many times over, and I've been very lucky to visit Turkey on many occasions as well. So uh, again, I'm really pleased to be back meeting with Turkish students today. So the big question that I want you as students to ask yourself is up on screen. So you should ask yourself what makes a successful student and flip it back on yourself. So what makes you a successful student? This is the best question that I think you can ask yourselves in terms of helping you find that perfect university or that perfect institution. Because of course we hear of all the big university names, we hear of the Ivy League universities, we hear of Oxford and Cambridge in the UK, across Canada, UBC, Toronto, McGill are of course very, very well known. And every country will have these world renowned institutions. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the perfect university for you. Or just because your older brother or sister or one of your friends or one of your parents has been to another university doesn't necessarily mean it's the perfect institution to you. So when you ask this question, what makes a successful student, ask it about yourself. What sort of environment do you need to be in in order to be successful both academically but also successful outside of the classroom? So keep this question in mind as we're going through. Now, every single student will have their own motivations. You know, I'm from the UK, I went to a good school in the UK in terms of high school, and of course there's a lot of well-known and very highly regarded institutions in the UK where you can study at university. But certainly, outside of the academia, outside of the, of the subjects, uh, what I wanted for my university experience was to be at a bigger institution, to be in a bigger country and have opportunities where I can actually combine my extracurricular activities with my studies and with my learning. So the North American approach was much more conducive to be able to do that as opposed to the UK system where very much you go to university, you study one subject for three years and everything else that's around the university, your extracurricular activities, your interests, your hobbies, there isn't as much emphasis on that as there would be in that North American system, which is why I decided to study overseas. So that was one of my main factors. So I'm sure you will all have your own. So definitely keep those in mind as you go through. But certainly during the last 15 years as working in the, as a professional in the international education sector, all of the motivating factors that I hear from students, or from parents or from teachers will all fall under one of these three different areas. So number one is, of course, the academics, choosing a university that is going to be pushing you to be the best academic that you can be. But also thinking about sort of rankings and reputation, that might come into it for some of you, for others of you, perhaps not as much. Uh, also within academics is the style and the structure of your learning. So again, the old 
uh, European approach is very much that you choose one subject and you study that for your three years and you don't have much flexibility within that. Whereas that North American approach, it's a four year degree and you actually have lots of opportunities to be much more flexible in your approach. So the style of learning or the style of teaching can be very, very important when it comes to choosing a university. Now, of course, location. Factor, uh, whether you stay at home or whether you go elsewhere around the world, whether you go to North America, whether you guys stay in Europe, whether you go to Southeast Asia, you can pretty much study anywhere around the world. So start thinking about your lifestyle, maybe from what climate you're looking for, the size of the university. Is it a true campus or is it a campus that's in the city center? All these things will be very, very important in terms of choosing your university. And of course, the final thing that I put up there is active learning. So active learning is everything outside of the classroom that can help, number one, with your academic understanding and the appliance of your academic learning into the real world. And also, number two, enjoying yourself and having great experiences outside of the classroom as well. So hopefully, these first couple of slides have helped give you an idea of what you might be looking for from your university experience. So definitely keep this in mind as we go through. Uh, but let's have a look at UBC and let's have a look at Canada in terms of the academic excellence and the style of academics and the quality of the academics that you can expect to find in Canada as a country. Because there are thousands of universities around the world where you can study and have a great experience. But why does Canada stand out and why does UBC, UBC stand out in particular? Um, well, for those of you who've had a look at rankings, whether it's QS rankings or the Cleans rankings, or Times Education Rankings, you will always see UBC as one of the world's top 40 institutions and also one of the world's top 25 public research institutions as well. So we are very highly regarded in that respect. We get some of the best students from all over the world and also we get some of the best professors from all over the world coming to teach uh, and learn at UBC's two campuses. Now in Canada in general, there are three big universities that I've already mentioned, UBC, McGill, and the University of Toronto, who typically are always in the top 40 or top 50, and typically make up the big three universities in Canada. Having said that, Canada is a public system, it's a very open system. Now because it's public, what it means is, any of the universities that you might be looking at within Canada will have a very, very high standard for teaching and learning opportunities. So whether it is a UBC, a Toronto, or McGill, or maybe some small institutions that you haven't heard of, you definitely will be guaranteed a good educational experience and a good overall experience as well. Now, moving forward, in terms of what you might find at UBC in particular, we are a very large research but, uh, university, but also we do a lot of programs in lots and lots of different areas. So we don't just focus in sciences, we don't just focus in business, we do everything. So we do engineering, we do hard sciences, we do commerce, we do arts, we do fine arts. Uh, we do land and food systems, we do film productions, pretty much anything that you can think of, you can study at UBC. Now, we break it down into what we call majors, programs, and faculties. So your major will be the specific course that you're studying. Uh, a degree program will be whether it's Bachelor of Science or whether it's Bachelor of Applied Science or Bachelor of Arts or Fine Arts. And the faculty is the general overall sort of team or department where your degree, where you'll be studying under, will lie. Now, even though most students that I tend to meet from Europe are usually engaged in things like sciences, business, uh, humanities, or engineering, it is very important to have a look outside of those main areas to see what might be of interest to you that is potentially linked to an interest you already have at high school. So to give you an example, I'm sure there's a lot of students here today that are really interested in doing sciences at university. You know, you're doing a science at high school, it's really enjoyable. But if you're able to look outside of your general areas of science, so look beyond biology, you look beyond physics, look beyond chemistry, and look beyond maths, and look at how you can apply some of those subject areas into a degree moving forward. So th some things that you can see on there, for example, where you can utilize science background and science high school qualifications would be engineering, it would be earth and marine sciences, it would be anatomy and physiology, uh, it would be pharmacology uh, as well, and pharmacy. So there's a lot of options at university that you're maybe not studying right now in high school, but can potentially be linked to some things that you are enjoying and studying right now whilst you're still a high school student. So definitely whether it's UBC or another university, when you're looking at courses that are on offer, look beyond some of those big subjects, look what else you might be uh, qualified for, you might be eligible for with your current high schooling subjects because it could be something really interesting jumps out at you and you think, yes, this is the perfect degree for me. 
Um, now, I just want to share a couple of things that UBC is very well known for. Uh, we are well known as being a very international university. As you can see from the screen, we do have almost 20,000 students studying with us who are non-Canadian, and that makes up about 25% of our student population. Now, last year, we were actually voted the most international university in North America by Times Higher Education. Now, that's really important because it's not just the international students that make up that. It's also those professors that we're attracting from all over the world, and also, perhaps more importantly for you, as an individual, the opportunities that you'll have to travel internationally and do things internationally whilst you are still an undergraduate student. So by that, I mean things like placements, volunteer programs, so lots and lots of opportunities to get great experience and travel at the same time. And also, reflecting back on international uh, and international university, it does mean great diversity within that student body as well. And I always say that this is extremely important once you start getting to university because you start to meet people from different backgrounds who are studying potentially the same things as you, but look, look on it in a slightly different angle. Now, the best example I can give for this is if there was 50 people in a classroom and you all thought the exact same way and did things the exact same way, if there was a problem that one of you couldn't solve, nobody else in that room could solve the problem because you're all trained to think the same way. So having that diversity in terms of academic background as well as cultural backgrounds really means that different ideas are, are there in the classroom. And definitely at a university like UBC, you will be learning almost as much from your peers, from your classmates and your friends and other students as much as you will be learning from the professors themselves. So that's very, very important to think about when you do start looking at a university experience. Now, a big question I do get asked a lot by students, and mainly parents, to be honest, is can a UBC or a Canadian degree be taken overseas, can it be taken elsewhere, and will it be recognized? And the answer is yes. We are a world top 40 institution, so you can definitely take your UBC degree and bring it back to Turkey if you want to uh, come back home afterwards and you can work in Turkey, make your career there, or you can go anywhere else in the world as well, do postgraduate studies or start your career. UBC is a very, very well known university across the world. Sorry, now, yes. Could you please uh, a little bit slow down? Yes, of course, yeah. Thank okay. You. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about how you earn your degree in Canada. So it is a very different approach than what you would find in most European universities. So if we, for example, were to compare the UK university system with the Canadian uh, university system, in the UK, it is a three-year degree, and typically when you apply to the university, you choose one subject area, and you study that subject area for three years, and there's not much flexibility. Now, when you're looking at Canadian universities, it is a four-year degree, and when you apply to the university, you're choosing one faculty, and within that faculty, there could be 10, 20, 30, 40 different academic subjects that you could study. So again, we'll stick with science as the example. When you apply to UBC and you're interested in sciences, you apply to the Faculty of Science different majors. So you can use your first year to try a few different subjects, see which ones interest you most, see which ones are most exciting to you, and then you can declare your major or your specialization at the end of your first year, moving into your second year. So it is a lot more flexible in that respect. Now also, if you are a student that loves, let's say, chemistry, but also maybe you want to try out biochemistry, we do have the option at UBC and in Canada to do what we call a double major, which means you can take two subjects all the way through to degree level. So as you can see, a very, very flexible approach to your learning. Now, in terms of contact hours, you'll be expecting to have between 15 and 18 hours of lectures per week in Canada. Again, if you compare that to Europe, most European universities, it's somewhere between nine and 12 hours of lectures per week. So in Canada, you do get more class time. You do have more opportunities to learn from your professors, and we call it contact hours. Now, the other great thing about the North American degree in general is the fact that you earn your degree as you learn. So every single semester, you'll be taking different classes and doing homework assignments, midterm exams, final end of term exams, and sometimes some group project work. And all of that goes towards your grade for that individual class. And then what we do is we add up all of the grades from all your individual classes over the four years to give you your final degree classification. So what that means is all the work that you're doing in the first semester of your first year, 
that will count just as much as all the work you're doing in the final semester of your final year. So again, you're earning that degree as you go along. At any given point in any given year, you will know exactly where you're stacking up. And again, if you were to compare and contrast with the European approach, there is a big emphasis on big exams at the end of each year in that European style of learning. And so not as much um, emphasis on homework assignments or midterm exams. So it's kind of weighted towards big exams, especially at the end of your second and third year. So have a think about your learning style. Are you someone that likes to go to class, that likes to work with other people, that does well on coursework? Or are you someone that maybe prefers less hours? Maybe you like to learn in your own speed, in your own time, and maybe you do like to take exams. Maybe you're a good exam taker. So have a think about how you learn and how you perform best, because again, that can be a really good indicator of whether that North American style degree or the European style approach would be best for you. Okay, let's have a look at UBC's two campus locations. So we are a West Coast uh, destination, but across Canada we have around 93 universities. And I did mention earlier that they're all public institutions, which means they have to maintain very, very high standards in order to keep getting the government funding and order to, keep, to, to stay in business. So why are more and more students coming to Canada every single year to study? Well. So a few reasons are on the screen. Uh, one is the quality of life that you can expect in Canada. We do have great education, we have great healthcare, we have great cities, we have a very open and liberal political system as well. Uh, so much so that we want students to come to Canada and if you are enjoying your time in Canada and doing great things after graduation, you can actually apply for permanent residency and eventually citizenship as well. So we do offer a three year postgraduate work permit so you can stay for three years after you graduate. And like I said, that can lead on to immigration status afterwards as well, which again, not necessarily the case in other countries around the world. Now, when we start looking at UBC campuses, we do have a split between our very, very big campus in Vancouver and our smaller campus over in the Okanagan region of British Columbia. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard of Vancouver. It is a world-renowned city. It's the third largest city in Canada with around two and a half million people living there. Very, very diverse in terms of the people who are there as well. So just under 50% of the people that live in Vancouver were actually born outside of Canada. So they've come to Canada and made Canada their home and actually chosen Vancouver as the city they want to live in. So it is a great place to be. It's a big city, lots of exciting things going on in the downtown area, great restaurants, great comedy, great sports great art, great music, great shopping. Uh, but also my favorite thing about Vancouver is the fact that we have great proximity or very close proximity to nature. So as you can see from the photo on the screen, we are a coastal university, a coastal city. We are on the Pacific Ocean, but also we have great access to mountains. Uh, if you like mountain biking, climbing, or hiking, or skiing, or snowboarding, all that is definitely available to you in the Vancouver area. Now, in terms of our campus, we do have a dedicated campus space, which is approximately four miles west of the city centre, and we have around 45,000 undergraduate students studying with us on this campus. Now, everything that you could possibly need is here in one place, all the classrooms, all the labs, all the libraries, the bookstores, the restaurants, the cafes, the sports facilities. We even have a park and beaches on campus as well, so we're very, very lucky to have this beautiful place out on the peninsula in the Pacific Ocean. So really, really beautiful campus, dedicated space, but only four miles away from the downtown city center of Vancouver. So we are a great example of a very, very large Canadian university. So 45,000 students is a lot. It's almost like a small town in itself. Now, it's important to think about your environment as an undergraduate student, because for some people, 45,000 students sounds very exciting, it's great, you're excited to go there and you're motivated by people and it will be a perfect fit for you. But for some people, 45,000 students might be too many. Maybe you're looking for something a little bit smaller, which is one of the main reasons why we actually created our second campus just outside the city of Kelowna. Uh, we call it the Okanagan campus because it's in the Okanagan region. Now, Kelowna is a city of around 200,000 people, so 
quite a bit smaller than Vancouver, but there's still a lot of things happening in there that you can get involved in. Uh, it is very well known for being a holiday destination for Canadians who want to holiday in Canada because it does have fantastically long and warm summers, and it's a great place in terms of its natural beauty. It is set on a huge lake. There's mountains and hills close by as well, lots of vineyards and organic food produce as well. So a beautiful place to be visiting, and if you're a student, it's a great place to be living. Now, in terms of the campus, we have a much smaller campus than the Vancouver campus. We have around 9,500 students studying at the undergraduate level with us on the Okanagan campus. But similar to Vancouver, everything is in one place, all the labs, all the classes, all the dormitories and residences, the food halls, cafeterias, everything is on campus. And the campus itself is about five miles away from the city of Kelowna. So it takes about 20 minutes on the bus. So definitely have a think in terms of campuses are you someone that's looking for that big university campus environment or are you someone that would prefer a smaller university experience as well? Because that will definitely influence the uh, your learning because you'll have more students in the classroom. And also at a big university, it could be that you maybe struggle to make friends a little bit easier because there's so many people and you don't necessarily bump into them every single day. So the feedback I hear from our Okanagan campus is in the social side of things, you do tend to bump into people uh, multiple times throughout the week because it is a much smaller environment, much more close-knit community than what you might find at the Vancouver campus. So definitely have a think about the environment and the size of the institution when it comes to applying to universities and accepting any offers. Okay, so I want to move on and talk about active learning because this is something that's very, very important, but I think it's not always talked about in university presentations. A lot of people will focus on the campus and they'll focus on the facts and the figures of how many students are there, how many courses are on offer, but we kind of miss what else is offered outside of the academics. So active learning is everything you're doing outside of the classroom that can help with your degree, uh, help with you getting great experiences, but also help in terms of that social aspect as well. Now, getting good experience is going to be more and more important for people as the years go by because more and more young people are going to university and getting good degrees. So when it comes to applying for jobs, it's not going to be good enough just to have a good degree. You need to have some experience to show, yes, you can do the job that you're applying for. Now, there's many ways to do this, and we've actually looked at research already and talked about research universities and what that means. But a research university can be a really great opportunity for undergraduate students uh, to come in and start doing research projects as soon as their first year, which means you're going to get some great experiences that you can put on your CV or your resume, which again, when you start applying for jobs, yes, you've got your degree, that shows you're educated, but getting involved in research can actually show that you can apply that knowledge and that theory into the real world. So research university is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, but also at UBC, we do actually have a good number of students every year where their research actually becomes their full-time career. So we have this concept of what we call spin-off companies at UBC, where you can actually get some investment from the university to set up your own company in partnership with UBC and go on and carry on with your research and maybe set up your own company and go into industry with industry partners after that as well. So research, it isn't just professors, it isn't just people in labs blowing things up uh, in white lab coats and masks. It is something that students do across all the different faculties and it can become your future career as well. Now, of course, we have lots of work experience opportunities. We do lots of internships, we do lots of summer placements. But one of the big things that UBC is well known for is something called co-optive education. Now, co-optive education, or co-op for short, is a series of structured work placements with companies that can be either in Canada or worldwide. And you'll do these in between academic learning in your third and fourth year. So after two years of study, the next summer, you might go out and work for a company and then come back for your semester of doing some learning. And then the next semester, instead of doing classes, you will be doing another work placement. And then maybe over the summer, you take classes or do another work placement again. But overall, you're gonna do a five year degree. And within those five years, you'll do your complete undergraduate, but also you'll have somewhere between 12 and 15 months of tangible work experience as well. Now, the benefit for you is obvious. You're getting great experience. You're also getting paid as a full-time, short-term contracted employee of this organization. And also you have the opportunity to travel and do different things as well. Now, the benefit for these organizations is that they use these work placements 
and these cognitive education placements as a recruitment tool. So they know that the future of their companies, the future leaders and employees of their companies are at these top institutions. So if they partner with UBC, they know they have some great students already and willing and waiting to come and work with them. Now, it's not unusual if you do some great things with that organization for them to offer you a full-time job before you even graduate. So you could finish your final placement with someone like Samsung and then before you even finish your last classes and final exams, they've actually offered you a job. So go back to campus, finish your final semester, ready and waiting for your, your career to start once you've finished. Now also, Cooperative education and work experience placements are a really great tool for you as undergraduate students to discover whether or not that company or indeed that job or that industry is going to be the right place for you for your future career. Now, what I mean by that is, for example, you could see someone like uh, like Disney, okay? And you're into your, perhaps you're, you're doing technology, you're doing fine arts, creative arts, or maybe doing computer programming, and Disney has lots of jobs available, and you go out organization is too big or maybe the offices where Disney is located isn't in the right place you can't imagine yourself living there uh, for the foreseeable future so what you can do for your second placement or your third placement your fourth placement is work for a different organization so you can actually do different placements within your cooperative education experience which means you can try on different organizations different roles different countries for size to see which you like best so think of these work placements almost as not only an opportunity for, for companies to recruit you, but for also for you to see whether or not you like those companies as well. Because it is much easier to do a three or four month placement and decide maybe Disney and uh, their offices aren't the right place for me. It's easier to do that after three months than it is if you sign a full-time contract and become a full-time employee for the organization after you've graduated. So definitely use these work placements as an opportunity to discover future careers moving forward. Okay, um, every time I go to Turkey, I'm always speaking to students who are interested in sports uh, and looking for sports scholarships. Uh, yes, we do have these at UBC. We do have sports scholarships for our various teams. Uh, we are a very, very good sporting university. So we do have over 35 different teams across men's and women's sports across the two campuses. We have football or soccer. Or we have American football, field hockey, ice hockey, track and field, swimming, volleyball, basketball, you name it, we probably have it. Uh, but also we have a different level in terms of sports. So we do have the varsity sports where you compete for UBC against other institutions across Canada and sometimes internationally. Uh, and also we have club sports and intramural sports, which are much more social in nature. Go out once a week, have some fun with your friends and keep fit in the process as well. So definitely that is an attractive thing for, for students looking to study at UBC and internationally in general. And then also one of the big things that we do at UBC that is probably one of the main sources of interaction between students are our clubs and societies. So we do have over 350 student-run clubs on both of our campuses, ranging in things from the social side of things, but also many that will have a professional angle towards them as well. So if you have a quick look on screen, you'll see we have the UBC Ski and Snowboard Club. That's the biggest club that we have on the Vancouver campus. It has the most students who are members. And we even have a lodge up in Whistler where students can stay for discounted rates. Uh, and of course, in winter and fall, we'll have students doing trips up to the various ski slopes around uh, around Vancouver and Kelowna. But if you have a look closer look, you might see the UBC Model United Nations, for example. And that is probably our most popular um, academic related club because we have students that will be joining that club from politics, from sciences, from business. Uh, so we do have students join this club from various different academic backgrounds. And it's just a great opportunity to develop some of the skills that you will need in your future professional career. So things like how to deliver a presentation, how to be, uh, how to how to deliver an argument without causing an argument, how to take on leadership roles, how to work as part of a team. So definitely getting involved in clubs and societies on campus will be a great opportunity for you to develop some of those soft skills that are gonna be important to you in your future career, but also they're really, really fun as well. 
Now, the last little section I want to talk on on this part of the presentation is opportunities for you to travel and get great experiences in terms of volunteerships whilst you're a student at UBC. So even though you might be a student coming to UBC from Turkey as an international student, you can still have opportunities to travel and do different things uh, outside of UBC's immediate campuses as well. So we do have over 240 partner universities worldwide, so you can definitely go and do an exchange program with another university for a semester or a full academic year if you're interested in doing that. But also, like I said, we have volunteer programs, we have short-term work placements, so this can be a really great opportunity for you to travel, see a different part of the world, get some great experiences, and also, if you're interested in volunteer work, go and do some great things that help other people as well. Okay, so the last thing, sorry, I lied. This is the last thing. Um, the last thing I want to talk about quickly in this section is once you do become a university student, it is important that you use that time to start planning for your future. So we've looked at getting a good degree, and we've looked at the opportunities to get great experiences, but You've probably heard the term networking, but you're probably not too familiar with that as a high school student. But networking is basically building a portfolio of contacts, of colleagues, and people that you stay in touch with in various industries or various companies all around the world that can help with either your workload or start looking for jobs. Maybe they can let you know about job openings, or maybe they can let you know about interview techniques or what you might need to do in order to be working for a particular organization or company. So at UBC, we actually have hundreds of thousands of alumni all around the world in various different countries, and many of them have actually signed up to be part of UBC's alumni network, which means as a UBC undergraduate student, you can actually find out who is living in a particular country, working for a company that you want to work with, and you can get in touch with them, and you can ask them, how did they get that job? What does that job entail? Can you follow in their footsteps? So definitely think about the alumni network and following in the footsteps of former UBC students, and don't be afraid to reach out to them. We are a huge university with worldwide reach, which means we have people uh, working in probably every single industry that you could imagine. So definitely take advantage of that. Okay, so let's move over to sort of the technical side of things. How do you get to UBC? How do you become a UBC student? What is the application process? Well, it is relatively straightforward. Uh, choose the campus, either a Vancouver campus or the Okanagan campus. Make sure that the course you're interested in is offered on that particular campus, and then check the degree requirements in terms of what grades and what courses you need to be taking at high school in order to be admitted to UBC. Now, you do apply online at u.ubc.ca, as you can see on screen there, and the deadline will be January the 15th of your final year at high school. So most of you will be January the 15th next year. And then also, the only other thing that we require from you will be documents. So we do make decisions based upon upon your academic scores, but also we have what we call supplementary information. So we do have a personal profile where we ask you about what you're doing outside of the classroom and what you're learning from your experiences outside of the classroom. And also for any students who are interested in fine arts or music production or theater, then there'll also be an additional requirement in terms of putting forth a portfolio of your work. Now, we do work on competitive evaluation, so most of the students that are coming in and being admitted to UBC will be very, very highly regarded academically, mostly A's across their high school career as well, but because we have the supplementary information, we do want to make sure that we're getting students who have those sort of personal qualities that will help them be successful as well. So it's not unusual for a student to get in with slightly lower grades overall because their supplementary information or their personal profile was very, very strong. Uh, and they might get in ahead of someone who maybe did get all A's, but maybe their personal profile doesn't mark them out as someone that will be successful at UBC. So it's a combination of things that we're looking at. So I can't actually give you specific grades, what you need to get into various faculties. All I can say is expect to be getting most of the A's, but also do take your time when it comes to writing the personal profile. Have a think about what you're learning outside of the classroom. Have a think about the things that you've achieved outside of your academics, and think about those and add them into the personal profile, because that will be very, very important. Okay, so let's have a look at costs. It costs uh, around 25,000 euros 
to study at UBC in terms of tuition. And then of course, on top of that, you will have room and board. So a place on campus and a meal plan will probably cost you around 10,000 euros for the academic year. And then additional costs, textbook, pens, pencils, paper, things like that will be around $2,000 as well, uh, euros, sorry, as well. Now you can work on campus as well. So many students do uh, work on campus part-time and earn money that they can look after their textbooks, laptop, things like that. But obviously that's not going to cover all your tuition. Having said that, we do give out a huge number of scholarships each and every year to international students. Last year, we gave out over $30 million to international students alone. The majority of these are what we call entrance awards. So you simply apply to UBC and you'll be automatically evaluated for these awards. And we can give up to 30,000 Canadian dollars every year for those awards. Now, for some of you students that might have a bigger financial need, we do have what we call our International Scholar Program. Now, the International Scholar Program, there's a little bit extra that you need to do for these, but these awards can be fully funded and pay for everything that you can't afford. And that would even include flights and accommodation and your meals as well. So whereas the entrance awards, you're automatically evaluated, you just apply and we do the rest. For the international scholars, you do actually have to do a little bit extra. So your school will have to nominate you for one of the two campuses. They will have to write some reference letters and say why you're deserving of the award. And you, as a nominee, will also have to write an essay about how you feel UBC can help you. And of course, why you deserve that award as well. Now, I will say this, whichever university you're looking at around the world, always double check about scholarships because you never know what funding might be available to you. And you might see university and look at the fees and think, I can't afford that. But if you dig a little bit deeper and have a look at the scholarships pages or send an email to, uh, to someone like myself who works for, works for the university, then they might be able to give you some more information about how you can receive a scholarship. Okay, so I have given you a lot of information in the last 35 minutes and I don't expect you to remember all of it, but please, please, please, if you only remember one slide, this is the slide for you to remember. So I want you to think about your university experience or choosing university in these three different areas. Think about the academics, the quality of the university, and also the style of the learning, the style of how you earn your degree. Think about the location. Is it a big university, a small university, campus-based, city-based, coastal, inland? All these things can be very, very important. And then, of course, the final thing that we talked about are those active learning opportunities. Everything outside the classroom that can help assist you in applying your knowledge and your theory into the real world, getting great experiences, and also, on the social side of things, really enjoying your time as a university student as well. So with that, I have actually posted my email address in the chat, chat box. So please feel free to, to write that down and make a note of that. But also you can see my email address on screen there as well. So I'm always happy to hear from students. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and go into the questions box. And I'm going to start ask, answering some of the questions that have popped into there. So if I click on questions, I should now see some info here. Okay, so great question that's just popped up is, can I give some more information about fully funded scholarships, like how many students get the scholarships each year? Yeah, great question. So for those International Scholar Awards, we're typically getting, uh, probably getting around four to 500 nominees each year for around 30 to 40 scholarships. So it is very, very competitive, uh, but if you're looking at the statistics, around one in 10 to one in 12, will be getting those those awards. So definitely it's worth taking your time on those applications. And certainly, you know, play the field, so to speak. Don't just apply to one B, uh, to UBC or one university for one scholarships. Have a think about the institutions you're interested in and apply for scholarships for all of those if you need to do, do those. Okay, so. Tom, could you please uh, order by upvote that uh, the questions upvote. get more? Oh, yes, sorry, I clicked on date. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Oh, both. Okay. okay, excellent. So what are the average living costs for an international student? It is mentioned that Vancouver is a little bit more expensive compared to other cities. Yeah, if you're looking at Canada, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal will probably be the three most expensive cities to live uh, because they're the three biggest cities. Um, it probably costs, 
if I were to try and relate it, it'd probably be similar to sort of, I guess, uh, living as a student in Istanbul or another major European city. Um, I'm from Manchester. I find Vancouver a, approximately as similar as Manchester, but not quite as expensive as London. Um, but yeah, if you're looking at fees, in terms of living on campus, you'd be looking at around 10,000 euros, and that would cover your meal plan and also having a room on campus for the academic year. And if you're looking at private housing in your second, third, and fourth year, it just depends whether you want an individual apartment or you're going to share with, with friends. But like I said, you can work part-time on campus, 20 hours during the term and 40 hours in holidays, so you can actually uh, earn enough money to take care of all your incidentals and all your entertainment uh, by doing a bit of work part-time. Okay, so another question. After graduation, how long do we uh, do we have to stay in Canada for seeking a job? Well, uh, you actually get three years. So as soon as you've graduated, you will have access to your Canadian work permit, which lasts for three years. And after that, if you've been working for the majority of the time, you can actually renew that for a further three years. And then if you want to, you can actually apply for permanent residency after, I think it's five years, and then um, citizenship after that. So actually, uh, one of my colleagues, one of my close colleagues and our director, Orchan Altantash, as you can probably guess from his name, is from Turkey. He was a student um, in the US actually, then moved to Canada, took advantage of the work permit, and he's now a Canadian citizen and works full time at UBC. So definitely lots of opportunities there. Okay, next question. Are there any scholarships for sports or high GPA? Sports, definitely, yeah, you have that opportunity. If you're interested in sports scholarships, the best thing to do is go onto the UBC uh, website, click on the athletics department and complete one of the athletics questionnaires or the recruitment questionnaires. That will then get passed to the head coach of the team you're interested in and they will talk to you about what scholarship opportunities they have. And also for high school GPA, we have those nominee awards that I've just talked about, but also we have those awards or what we call entrance awards where you simply apply and if you're a great student, we will try and give you some funding there as well. Okay, so next question. Scholarships again, I think we've talked about that one okay. Um, although I will add, you don't have to be an IB student or have an SAT score just for scholarships. Your general application, whatever your uh, your background, academic background is, we will consider you for those. So don't worry too much if you're not doing IB or an SAT. Um, there's a question here. Can I apply for work permit on my first year of undergraduate program? Yeah, um, as part of your study permit, you actually can work 20 hours during term and 40 hours during the holiday. So your study permit also acts as your work permit uh, while you are a student. So I'll answer that one. Okay, another great question here. Um, what are the co-op options for engineering students and how do they compare to other Canadian institutions? Okay, great question. So at UBC, we have around four and a half thousand placements every single year uh, for students in all different faculties. Now, if you're looking at engineering, I will direct you to their website where you can actually see some examples of who we work with, where the placements are and what you'll be doing. Now, obviously engineering is a very, very broad sphere of academia. So we have chemical engineers where you might be working solely in the lab. We have mechanical engineers. We might be working with Boeing down in Seattle on airplanes. So it very much depends on what you would like to do, but definitely have a look on the UBC co-op website for engineering to see examples of that. Okay, uh, what application deadlines are there for UBC master's programs? Uh, the master's programs, it depends on the faculty. So without knowing that, I'll encourage you again to have a look uh, online and check the, the admissions uh, programs there. Sometimes it will be uh, January 15th, sometimes it will be March, sometimes it will just be open until, uh, until everything's filled. Okay. Another question, is it possible to get a graduate degree in a different but somehow related field than the undergraduate degree? Yeah, you can do that as well. So for example, if you are doing an undergraduate degree but it has some sort of crossover or some affiliation to something else, you can definitely do that. But again, what you'd need to do there is have a think about what you would like to study at postgraduate level and then go and look at the admissions requirements for that. So without specific details there, Melissa, I'm not sure um, what extra information I can give you. Okay, another question on scholarships. How competitive are they? Yeah, for those international scholars, they are very, very competitive. So like I said, one in 10 or one in 12, the nominees will be, will be getting those. But for the entrance awards, 
Uh, when I was looking at European statistics last year, around one in three students from, uh, from Europe, European schools, were getting some sort of scholarship. So we do give out $30 million each and every year to our international students. So you do have very, very good opportunities to, to get some funding there. And then also another great question that's related to scholarships is what are we looking for? Uh, for the fully funded scholarships. So for those international scholars, it is a combination of great academics, but also doing interesting things outside of the classroom and showing that you are um, committed to doing things outside the classroom to help with your local community. So that local community could be your school community, it could be sort of your home community. So just doing interesting things outside of the classroom as well as having uh, good academics will be very, very important. Okay, IB requirements. Good question. Um, I did mention earlier that we do have the personal profile, so that is gonna be factored into it. But in general, what I'm typically seeing for students, uh, if we look at Vancouver, uh, Vancouver First, uh, engineering is typically the most difficult to into. We'd be looking 38, 39 IB points and above to be competitive. Uh, business and sciences, 36, 37, 38, around there would be competitive. And for the Faculty of Arts, maybe 34, 35 and above will be competitive there. If you're looking at the Okanagan campus, you could probably take a couple of points off each of those that I've just mentioned, mainly because the Okanagan campus doesn't quite have that same history and visibility uh, as the Vancouver campus does, even though you are getting the same degree. Okay. So again, following up from that, how important a role does the personal profile play? It plays a very, very important role, but it also depends on the faculty that you're applying to. So, for example, the business school, they actually weight it 50-50. So 50% on your academics and 50% on the personal profile. Engineering and sciences, it's usually more heavily weighted in terms of your academics because it's much more, um, I guess, you really have to ensure that you've got that sound academic understanding to be successful in those areas. And then probably somewhere like arts, it would be, or humanities, around 30% on the personal profile. 70% on the academics itself. Okay, so another question. There's a few few questions here about master's degrees and postgraduate qualifications and scholarships. And again, this will be very, very dependent on the specific faculty that you're applying to. So I can't give any firm answers from that other than saying, please go to the, the specific website for the program you're interested in and have a look there because it will all be listed on there. Um, another student uh, question here, sorry, admissions requirements for political science. Uh, at master's level, again, um, it all depends very much on what you want to study and what you've done at your undergraduate degree. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to master's level applications. You have to have a good first degree, so if you know a two on or above would be would be relevant there. Uh, and then also putting a good, good uh, letter uh, in there about why you want to study at UBC and why you want to study that specific program will be very, very important as well. Okay. Okay, another question here. Is it a disadvantage if we don't take IB or AP in high school? No, um, we are very, very familiar with all curriculums around the world. As you saw earlier in the presentation, we do have applications from over 160 countries worldwide, so we are familiar with, with all curriculums. So if you're doing the local Turkish curriculum, uh, absolutely fine. We get students every year applying and coming to UBC with that, so don't worry about that. Uh, and another question that we have here. Okay, one second. I'm trying to just get some of the undergraduate questions because we do have a lot of repeat questions here. Uh, what are the international relationships uh, like with France and, and their universities? Yeah, France is an interesting uh, question that we've got here because France has an agreement with the government of Quebec, which is another province in, in Canada, whereby you pay a much lower rate of tuition fees if you're a French citizen. So that could be interesting in terms of finances. Uh, but in terms of sort of overall, we do have a number, I think we've got 
and eight universities that we partner with in France. But also of interest could be the dual degree we do with Sciences Po. So you will do two years at Sciences Po and two years at UBC and actually come away with a dual degree from both those institutions as well. Uh, we also do something similar in Hong Kong as well. So two years at University of Hong Kong and then two years at UBC. So there isn't necessarily one size fits all approach when it comes to doing exchange programs or having experiences of international travel. So definitely have a look at our, uh, at our exchange page or our Go Global page and see what is available to you there as well. Okay, I'm just sort of seeing if we've got any more undergraduate questions here. We seem to be coming to towards the end of the questions. Um, another question here about sports uh, in terms of scholarships. So like I said earlier, the best thing to do in terms of sports is whether you're interested in scholarships or just want to compete and be part of the team, go to the UBC Thunderbirds or the UBC Heat website. So Thunderbirds is Vancouver and Heat is the Okanagan. And just complete one of the recruitment forms and one of the coaches will get back to you uh, as soon as they've been able to, to go through those things and talk to you about scholarships and what it means to be part of the team. Okay, good question here. I'm a student studying at Langara College, which is a, a local college in BC, in Vancouver, and I want to continue in British Columbia in BC. Okay. Um, if you are looking to transfer across to universities, then what you need to do is apply as a transfer student and they will look at your last 30 credits. And if you meet the, the requirements in terms of your grade point average and also the classes you're taking are relevant, then you'll be able to transfer across. And also you can do that at master's level as well if you want to do that. Okay, I'm just trying to see if we've got any more relevant questions because a lot of these are repeat. Um, okay, question here. Is there an example of an admitted student with a Bachelor of Science GPA lower than 3.0? Uh, this is looking for masters. Um, yeah, it just depends on your overall application. Uh, obviously, your first degree is going to be the main thing they're going to be looking at. involved or an interview involved that will play a big part in it so it's not going to be just your grade point average I think also uh, the overall application is going to be very important there as well okay I think we've got time for just a couple more questions here as well a good question here is what can you say about the faculty of science uh, and in particular the biology department um, yeah great question I mean UBC is well known for its sciences um, we have across the faculty of science we have a huge array of different programs that you can study, so lots of opportunities. But in terms of biology, there's lots of opportunities within that specific subject area to do sort of more research-based um, classes and more research-based focus, or maybe combine that with different areas as well. So we do obviously do a general biology, but we also do zoology, we do plant biology, animal biology. Uh, you can combine that with earth and environmental sciences. So there's lots of opportunities to combine different academic programs with different areas that could be complementary or they could even be completely opposite but it's just something that you want to do as well. So one of the big things about the general Bachelor of Science degree is that it is very very flexible and there are lots of opportunities to go and get great work experience and traveling experience as well and I think that's going to be the most important thing to you as an undergraduate student is combining not only good academics but also combining that with getting some great experiences that will help in your future career as well. So I will encourage you or that particular student or any student that's interested in sciences to go to science.ubc.ca. Um, we are one of the world's top 30 uh, universities in terms of science in particular, so we're really, really proud of that. Um, and like I said, lots of different opportunities within sciences. Uh, when you're looking at certain courses like ecology, oceanography, computer science, maths, biology. Uh, we are actually the number one university in Canada for those. So we are very, very strong in the sciences uh, there as well. Okay, so I think we're coming to the end. I've got time for two more, so let's go here. So um, one second, let me pick a good question. Okay, so do we need an English test score if our undergraduate studies are entirely in English? Um, if you've been studying in English for the past four years, then you can apply for an English language waiver, which means you won't have to take an English language test. Uh, and if you're getting a score on your IB or a score on um, your AP or A-levels, 
in English that's uh, that's decent, then you will be able to skip those as well. But we do have all that information. Just type in uh, UBC English Language Admission Standards, and it will take you to uh, to our page where it shows all nine different ways that you can meet those. Okay, one question left here. Okay, time for one more question. Uh, let me make sure I pick a good one, and we'll keep it undergraduate level. Uh, okay. One second. Yeah, we, we, we've, I think we pretty much answered all the questions there. Another que another few questions on scholarship. So I'll just reiterate that about the funding uh, that you'll that you'll need at UBC. So when you apply to UBC, the majority of our scholarships, all you do is apply, and then we will automatically evaluate you for the scholarship. So what we're looking for is generally a good GPA, but also because we have that personal profile aspect to the, to the application, we're looking for a good score on that personal profile as well. So do make sure that when you're applying, you know, you're taking your time on that personal profile because that will be uh, a really good and very, very important part of the, the scholarship process. And then also away from the automatic evaluations, we have those nominee awards, so those international scholar awards, where your school has to nominate you for those, and also you have to write an extra essay. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all the questions that we've got here. Uh, one of the questions I did have was, does my email account start with a capital letter? Uh, no, it's just tom.whitaker at ubc.ca. So if you go back into the, uh, the chat section, then you can see, Right at the very top, I've put my name and my email address on there. So please feel free to write that down. Um, yeah, and I'm going to have to sign off. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to everybody for, for taking the time to join me today and join the event. It's, uh, it's been quite enjoyable. It's my first one back after the winter break. So I apologize if I was a little bit rusty. But hopefully you got all the information that you needed from there. And if you didn't, then please feel free to, to stay in touch. Um, one thing I will say is, again, I work solely with the undergraduate programs. So if you are interested in finding out more information about postgraduate qualifications, I will direct you to the website uh, because each of the faculty will have a postgraduate advisor who will be able to talk to you in depth with much more detail than I could ever give about the processes there as well. So any undergraduate courses or questions that you might have, please feel free to send them to me at tom.whitaker at ubc.ca. And for any of those postgraduate questions, please uh, have a look online at our u.ubc.ca website and do a search for your particular program or faculty that you are interested in. So with that, I'm going to say farewell, thank you, and goodbye to everybody. And I look forward to hearing from some of you in the future. Thank you, and I'll pass back over to, to Zainab. Thank you very much, Tom, for your presentation. We Welcome. believe it was a really comprehensive webinar for the participants as well. Uh, you put a real effort answering the questions. Uh, I would you. also like to thank the participants in Turkish as well. Katıldığınız için teşekkür ederiz. University of British Columbia ile ilgili diğer sorularınız için Tom'un paylaşmış olduğu e-mail ile iletişime geçebilirsiniz. Ayrıca haftadaki İsveç'te eğitim ve kariyer konulu webinarımıza da bekleriz. Thank you again Tom. It was a pleasure to have you in IFT Talks. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care of yourself and your family. Thank you. You too. Bye bye guys. Bye bye.